2,600 years ago, the prophet Isaiah prophesied that Israel would become a nation in a day. And it was uh, phrased as, has anyone ever heard anything like this? Has it ever been from the beginning of time that a nation is born at once? And yes, Israel, which had not been in more than 2,000 years, in one day, by an act of the United Nations, was born in one day. May 15th, 1948, and from that day, the archeological finds that prove the veracity of the scriptures have been coming forth from the ground. Literally, ladies and gentlemen, the rocks are crying out. But yet, the mainstream media and the world at large wants to ignore it, wants to avoid it, because they do not want to believe that there is a God in heaven who is in control of the universe that he made a promise to Abraham that all the land from the Euphrates to the Nile belongs to the sons of Israel and that he will fulfill that promise. The rocks are crying out and we have with us Jerry Bowen who is the director of the Biblical Archaeology Institute, the Anchor Stones International, and he has been on a quest not only for these particular discoveries, but also to disseminate this information and get it out to the world at large. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Jerry Bowen. Jerry, it's wonderful to have you here. Absolutely. Delighted and to be here. We, we've been um, on, a, uh, on a spiritual journey, the, the two of us, which uh, comes from different uh, different points uh, uh, in the universe. I was raised, as I say, a, a Jewish Baptist, and uh, and you were raised as as a Catholic. But uh, okay. you, even from a youth, you didn't quite fit into that pocket altogether. Now, did you? Well, of course. Uh, I don't know. I guess I just have the makeup of uh, someone who questions things, like maybe many people. But um, uh, the things that I questioned weren't viewed very favorably. Uh, for example, I remember uh, when we would go to religion class, um, <clears throat> we would open the Bible, and the Bible said, you know, that Noah was a man who lived uh, 950 years, or Adam was a man who lived 930 years. And I would raise my hand and say, you know, how is that possible for uh, someone to live that long? And, of course, the response that I got was kind of startling. They said, well, the Bible doesn't really mean years. It means months. You know, that's 930 months, not years. And then, you know, when you start to analyze things like that, you realize, well, the scriptures say, you know, that, that Adam, when he was 130, you know, he was having his son Seth. So 130 months puts him, what, about 10, 12 years old, something like that. <laughs> so it just doesn't add up, you know. But we had other, other issues that we dealt with um, just uh, from a... <clears throat> Uh, an educational standpoint, you know, the church... Well, you, did, you did a research project, didn't you, uh, in, a, in a special report that kind of fired things up? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it seems like that, that aspect uh, to my character has always been there. I just didn't realize it, uh, realize how much. Uh, when I was uh, 10, 11 years old, we had an assignment to do. We were studying the history of the church, etc. And um, I found out in my report, in my research, that the church really was extremely, I mean, extremely wealthy. A lot of art treasures, a lot of trinkets and things, uh, all stored mainly at the Vatican, but an extremely wealthy uh, um, denomination. And yet at the same time, um, they had us doing other projects. They would hand out these folders that would, uh, <clears throat> basically it was a folder that said, Save a Pagan Baby. It was a missionary type project that they were getting the kids involved with. Save a Pagan Baby. And we, okay. would, take our, we would take our candy money, uh, and we would, you know, our quarters and so forth, and we would fill slots in these cards. And then, of course, once we filled up a, a whole, whole book, well, we turned that in as, as an offering, like a missionary offering, and then we were saving a pagan baby, is what it was called. But after doing the research... After doing the research, I basically stood up when I did my report and I told this, the other kids, I said, look, man, save your candy money. You know, there's no reason to, for them to, to, to need our little, little, little trinkets of offerings there. I said, their church is completely wealthy, you know. So they don't need, need what we're doing. And so that kind of raised a little, a little ruckus. So this is, uh, this is your presentation it's in my class. Presentation in class. Catholic school. In the school, yeah. So they, <laughs> they didn't appreciate it very much because, uh, you know, it was, it was something. But, you know, I was just looking at the reality of it. Mm -hmm. And, um, of course, I didn't appreciate having to, to give my, what was kind of sacrificial for the kids in, in a lot of respects, um, when the church had 
tremendous resource. They could have sold one painting and we'd have saved uh, oh, a thousand exactly. pagan babies, you know? <laughs> just so anyway, just things well, like I, that. I think that's what Martin Luther said. <laughs> if, the, if the Pope wants to build the cathedral, He's got the pocket change to be able to do that. Yeah. Why are they selling indulgences where where a person can buy the uh, the forgiveness for for raping a virgin for two dollars and thirty seven cents? They can rape a virgin in the future if they will give that for the rebuilding. Right. And, and this is just absolutely ludicrous. So yeah. you started challenging these things. I mean, at eleven you know, for you to even be yeah. thinking of you know what reality is at eleven. Yeah. Most uh, most eleven year olds aren't there, but uh, you know, it doesn't take long to be around you, Jerry. You can tell that you're 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 made of a different fabric, and you you saw something that. Well, as a matter of fact, uh, you were ten years before I ever woke up to the fact. But I saw a video. Uh, it was over twenty years ago, way back before the turn of the century, and uh, and it was uh, I saw this video. And it was on some discoveries of Noah's Ark, Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, the Red Sea crossing, which really captivated my attention, and then uh, the Ark of the Covenant. And that, that was just way, way beyond what I could believe. But I saw this other stuff, and it's like, I, I thought, you know, if they really found Pharaoh's chariots and army strewn for a mile and a half on the bottom of the Red Sea, if we've got that on video, it's like, why has this not gone like wildfire through the Christian church? I, I, I just didn't get it. I thought this is one of the greatest testimonies uh, and literally the rocks crying out in this generation. And when I saw that, uh, I was skeptical, but you started, it was more than 10 years before that, that you saw some of this evidence and you as a skeptic and wanting to challenge everything. I mean, even from grade school, what, sure. what happened to you? Tell us about your journey in this, because uh, you have, uh, as far as I know, I think you have been in Turkey, you have been to the mountains of Uratu more than any other person that I know of uh, on the planet. And so I want you to, to go back in time and take us on that journey. What was the moment that, that you began to wake up? Well, you know, I was always interested in the story of, uh, for example, Noah's Ark, and, and probably as Probably as an outsider, I'm probably one of the um, one of the only people that has, has been to eastern Turkey. <clears throat> I mean, a lot of people go to Istanbul and places like that in the west, but out east is where my interest <clears throat> really lies with uh, the Kurdish folks mostly, and uh, of course the remains of the Ark. But <clears throat> at, at an early age, I was just fascinated with the the concept that there would be physical evidence. Um, remaining that verified the stories of the Bible. And um, I remember uh, at an early age, just after getting married, which was into my 20s then by that time, uh, I'd looked at various programs. I think they, Hollywood even came out with several programs on the, the search for the ark. And it was always yeah. up, it was always up, uh, you know, uh, in the, in, embedded in the snow somewhere. It was up high and then it broke in half at some point and lower, part of it was right. down lower. Right, a lot lower. of stories. That Sun Pictures <laughs> came out with one. Yeah. I saw that while I was in sure. Bible school yeah. and, uh, uh, and, and a lot of claims, as a matter of fact, uh, on, in that particular picture, these people that brought back a piece of the ark, well, it turned out they admitted later that they took a piece of wood, boiled it in fruit juice, right. and baked it in an oven for like two weeks. Sure. So a lot of, in finding something on Mount Ararat itself, when the Bible doesn't say that, and yet, you know, well, our English version right. leads people right. to, to think that, right. okay? But they go look on a mountain that didn't exist in the time of Noah, a 17,000 foot post flood volcano. Sure. And so, you know, a lot of things didn't didn't fit, but you began to see things that did fit. Right, well of course uh, Ararat itself became the tradition, uh, the traditional place to search, to look for. And uh, people just hadn't thought it through like a researcher would. If a researcher sat down and, and looked at the mountain, they would first say, well let's find out how long this mountain has been here, let's see how it developed, what kind of mountain is it? I mean, you know, you're, you're just going through methodically, running it to ground, all these particular questions. Mm -hmm. And if a person would sit down and do that, they would realize that uh, not only Mount Ararat, but any particular mountain would not be a viable candidate for any floating object, object to descend upon it because of flow dynamics. The, uh, you know, as a, a, an object floats down, the flow f from a peak would, would move, move it away from the mountain, actually. 
So it, it's really bad science from that standpoint to think that, that the arc would come to rest on any peak. But yet this is a volcano. This is a strata volcano that developed over the last 2,500 years. So as you mentioned, it wasn't even there uh, when the arc came to rest there 4,300 years ago. So, I mean, these are the things that uh, um, people should be questioning. But for some reason, it's, it's a lot easier, I guess, to go along with the status quo, with the tradition. And once yeah, you when the King James Version says Mount Ararat, sure. instead of reading the Hebrew and and right. and looking a little bit deeper, you know, because at that time there was something called Mount Ararat at the time the King James translators were, were working on the translation. That's but if you go back to the Hebrew, um, that's not what it says. That's right. And so uh, it, it identifies a region, the region of Urartu. Uh, specifically, and of course that encompassed uh, a good bit of eastern Turkey, but also parts of Armenia, parts of Iran. And so you had a, a region, uh, it was a kingdom, it was a kingdom of Urartu, in fact. And uh, so the Bible identifies a particular region, not a specific mountain peak. Mm -hmm. So, so what, uh, what happened? What, what, what woke <clears throat> you up? What was it that you saw that first got your interest? Because now you've been over there, what, like 30 times? You, you've taken tour groups over there. And this is a fairly dangerous area over there with the, with the Kurds and, and with the conflicts going on over there. So something had to compel you to do something that most people on the planet are afraid to do. I, I know people that have been there and they will never go back. They came out of there shell-shocked. Yeah, well, again, being very interested in the story itself and uh, the, the physical evidence that perhaps Scripture could provide, um, when I uh, started to learn of uh, Ron Wyatt's uh, ex escapades over there, his research, I uh, became very inspired. It, it was, as a matter of fact, a, uh, just a church camp meeting, a week-long camp meeting that I attended back in 80, I think it was 1987, <clears throat> that uh, we attended a camp meeting. And someone was there showing, I thought we were going to be looking at the Dead Sea Scrolls and pottery shards and things of that nature, just typical biblical archaeology things. Uh, and all of a sudden we were looking at recent video clips of the remains of Noah's Ark and the remains of Sodom and Gomorrah and the Red Sea crossing site and these kind of things. And so... Uh, I recognize that this is, you know, this this site was not on the mountain. It wasn't encrusted in ice and that kind of thing. So it was something different. And so, again, having that inquisitive mind, I wanted to definitely check it out. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the week was so intense with all of this information. Uh, it was a, a bit overwhelming. And I I came out of there thinking, this is either... A hoax, you know, probably one of the greatest hoax perpetrated upon the Christian community. Yeah, bigger I mean, than the, the movie that they made in Hollywood. Sure. This is... Uh, uh, of course, the other alternative was that God was really up to something significant. Hmm. And I was impressed. I was compelled to want to find out what that could possibly be. But uh, I had to approach it, of course, with a healthy skepticism. And that, that's the way that, uh, that anybody should look at anything like this. They should really, you know, take a, a good look. Uh, mm -hmm. But give it an objective look. Yeah. You know, don't just write it off because you've been taught something else. Um, I think one of the reasons why um, in the Christian community even today there's some apprehension is because I think a lot of people within um, the theological realm, the pastoral realm, they might be thinking that, well, you know, this evidence, you're holding this evidence up and it is compelling evidence, but, you know, we don't want anything to replace faith. You know, the Bible says we're like facts. Yeah, we, we don't want anything. So they're, they're, they're afraid that for some reason. But, you know, what we're talking about, uh, let's put it this way. Uh, I don't believe God would ever uh, have provided all of this material uh, if he didn't know that it, at least one person on the planet would be redeemed as a result of its exposure. So even, and of course, I know it's impacted millions of people, actually. I've, I've talked to a lot of folks. Yeah, now there but, are a lot of people out there, Jerry, that, uh, that are watching this broadcast that have never heard this. They, they do not realize that they've actually found 
the remains of Noah's Ark, the petrified remains in the mountains of Uratu, uh, that the Turkish government has built a visitor center, a four-lane highway, mm -hmm. it's on the maps. Uh, and, and yet, with this, this is all being kept from the majority of people, especially in, in America. You know, here's a republic that was, that was founded on creator-given rights, and what has happened is that uh, they've been doing their best. The atheist socialists who, who got put into positions uh, of, of authority in the United States, which they should never have been allowed to, to even step into, they have uh, basically taken over the education system and has forced this fairy tale that there is no God. Sure. If there is no God, there are no God-given rights nice. upon which this uh, uh, republic was founded, and that is how you can completely control the, the mind of an entire generation. You can feed them all sorts of, of, uh, of, of mm -hmm. error and lies, and the last thing they want is for any, anything that would verify the that the Bible <laughs> is true. <clears throat> and um, and so you know we we've got that end and, and so most of the world most of the Christian world doesn't get to hear this because it's it's been wiped from the from the um, the memory of the people in America uh, the the memory of there being a God even mm -hmm. and and this is also going out around the world so you know as uh, you begin to tell the story you know my mind is just uh, starting to come alive with this because just going back and remembering that first time when I saw the evidence like you did mm -hmm. it's like man we this this is something this is great. This is something that I can use to wake people up because God is alive. His testimony is still here on the earth. You can't deny it yeah. unless you want to close your eyes. Sure. And, and, of course, the other thing that really was very remarkable uh, as I researched it out was the, the manner in which the Lord <clears throat> brought these things forth. I mean, he, he had preserved them, of course, but the manner in which he was going to bring them forth to the general public uh, was also quite amazing. Uh, I know when Ron Wyatt first went out there in 1977, and you may have heard the story, uh, he didn't know where to go. He just knew. Uh, he had looked at a Life magazine article, uh, 1960 Life magazine article, September, and they had an article in there about an expedition that had taken place in, earlier that year <clears throat> called the Vandeman Expedition. And so Ron was inspired by that, and eventually 17 years later he was compelled to to take himself and his two sons, and there's even a, a miraculous thing there with them getting their passports in time. Uh, I mean, one of his sons, I think, got his passport in just two days, which is almost unheard of uh, today. But they made the trip out there, and they didn't know where to go. They had contacted uh, some of the remaining members of the expedition team in 1960, and they just said, well, look, we just know it's close to Mount Ararat. There, there are no roads, et cetera, et cetera. So they were, they were, it was like a, definitely like an Indiana Jones exploration for them. And uh, because they didn't know where to go um, and still felt very compelled, the only resource they had was to trust that God would lead them. And so Ron was that kind of person, and that always impressed me, uh, that, that he would ask the Lord, you know, if you want me to find this, you're going to have to direct me. Mm -hmm. And so uh, they, they did it the hard way. They went out, uh, they, they landed in Istanbul, and then they took a train clear across the country to a place called Erzurum, which is still about four hours away from uh, Dugal Bayezid, which is the easternmost city, which is the closest to the Ark. And then they took a taxi. So they're taking a four-hour, they're, they're going across the country in train, which we don't do anymore, of course. And then they, they uh, take a taxi from Erzurum, which is a four-hour trip. And just as they get toward Dogo Bayes, it, it's starting to, you know, starting to, be, to get the sun starting to lower and whatnot. They still have some light, but it's starting to get dark. And so the taxi's got his, his lights on and whatnot. Unbeknownst to the taxi driver, who could not speak English, so there, there wasn't any real communication there, Ron and the boys had prayed a simple prayer. They said, Lord, you just stop the taxi where we need to look. Now, that's, that's not scientific. That's pretty simple. Right, and, and uh, for a lot of the Christian world, they can't even relate to this because, you know, I, I grew up in a Christian church, went to every Wednesday night prayer meeting for 17 years, and I never saw a miracle. I never heard an, uh, uh, anyone get anything directly from the Heavenly Father, but I knew. All you have to do is read the book of Acts. You know that the Holy Spirit can lead, and if you'll pray and ask, He will show you. And, and, and so when I heard part of this story, 
I, I, I related to it. I knew that Ron White was being led by the Spirit, which does not fit the book for a professional archaeologist or basically professional religionist. They don't sure. hear from heaven because, right. you know, he's trying to do the will of God, sure. not build a denomination. Yeah. So what was amazing is as they're driving down the road, uh, the vehicle cuts off. And you can just imagine, I mean, I would have loved to have had a little mini cam in the back of that taxi <laughs> <laughs> to see their faces as, uh, as that vehicle drifts off to the side of the road. And, of course, the driver has no, no clue what's going on. But Ron looks at the boys, the boys look at him, and they're going, are you kidding me? You know, <laughs> wow, this is amazing. So they, they get out, and they, they know they're not going to be able to do any exploration. And then they pile up a pile of rocks on the side of the road. And that's the area they're going to explore. So the taxi driver tries to start the vehicle again. It starts right back up. Of course, they had gotten back in. They drive a little further down the road, and it cuts off again. And they look at one another with maybe a little less enthusiasm now, but they still get out, and they pile up some rocks at this location. They get back in the taxi, and, of course, the taxi driver, he doesn't understand what's happening. They go a little further down the road, and the taxi stalls again. And, and Michael, now they're thinking, oh, wow, we got a bum taxi. I mean, they've been driving for almost four hours, mm -hmm. right? And they're close to the, the city itself. And, I mean, that's how we are as human beings. We, you know, God is directly doing something, and we start to doubt a little bit. But the, still, they got out, and they piled up some rocks. Probably a little smaller pile this yeah. time. <laughs> yeah, maybe so, a little smaller pile. But, uh, and, of course, the taxi driver, you know, he's beside himself. He's got the hood up. He's trying to figure out what's going on. You know, but eventually they get back in the car, and they go on to their hotel. And then it's, it's the next day that, that they come back, and they start the, the, from the first pile. They, they go ahead and work perpendicular to that. And they begin to find things. Uh, and, of course, Ron was uh, pretty sharp. He was pretty astute. He was well-read. Uh, he, he wasn't a professional archaeologist. He wasn't from academia, even though he, had a, a, uh, he was a nurse anesthetist. But <clears throat> he, uh, he went Had ahead. Had to make good money because all this, uh, no university is funding this. He's doing it on his own. Doing it all And his own. literally, he's, he has researched uh, from when the, uh, the Life magazine article came out. Sure. He's been involved in research uh, to, to finally drive him to, to do this act. Exactly. And so, you know, it was this story of, uh, as they went back and researched these out, what's impressive about the story is that Ron went over there looking for one thing. He was looking for the, the, the remains of the, of the ship. Mm -hmm. And God just said to him, well, as long as you're in the neighborhood, let me, tell, let me show you this and let me show you this as well, the, the circumstantial evidence that's related. Mm -hmm. And so that, that story became very inspiring to me as, as I would learn it, um, not, not by the films that I watched at that camp meeting, but going and finding the, the person that was leading out and actually chatting with them for literally hours uh, after the fact. And I spent pro probably the whole week, that whole week, just absorbing everything that I could absorb on, on that, that research material. Mm -hmm. And that, that's what really motivated me to get going back in 1987-88. Uh, now, what Ron first saw at where these things were stopping, he, uh, he investigated, and they turn out to be the very things that your organization is named after, is it not? Yes, one of the things, uh, anchor stones or drogue stones, we would call them. Mm -hmm. that, that's right. And, uh, and so you, you're, you're going to be showing us some things at this right after our break. We're going to be getting into this. But, sure. uh, but these drogue style anchor stones that were used on the ark, these massive uh, stones, you know, as soon as I saw them, they, I, I live in the, the, the Galilee. The, the Sea of Galilee is right down below my house. And I have on my porch a number of anchor stones that are exactly like that, that, wow. that have the, the, uh, the, the holes drilled through, uh, bored through with the the, for the, the knots and all that. And this is what is uh, used, and they find these all over the place, but mm -hmm. not at this height, not at this size. These are, are completely, uh, you know, the, the size of them is beyond anything that, that we could uh, handle, you know, the size that Absolutely. we are today. Absolutely. Of course, we're, we, we didn't grow up to be, uh, you know, 900 years old either right. and uh, be able to work on the ark for, for 100 years. But uh, you're going to be showing some of these evidences uh, as, um, uh, as you discovered 
them by going back over the very places right. that, that you saw in Ron's presentation then. Sure, absolutely. We're with Jerry Bowen, the director of Anchor Stones International. Uh, he has written the book, The Ark Secret, the true location of the Ark of the Covenant, to which we hope that we'll have time to be able to get into the details concerning the Ark of the Covenant. But right now we're going to join Jerry on his adventure uh, to the mountains of Uratu, uh, where he has been more than 30 times, taken many groups over there uh, of researchers uh, for the evidence of the Ark of Noah. Jerry, please take us on the trip. Okay, one of the things, of course, that uh, one of those piles of rocks that Ron uh, uh, piled up next to the road led him to this area. Let's be called different names. Uh, in archaeology, uh, place names have become a very important aspect of archaeology. And one of the things that's uh, necessary to understand is that the same geographic location can be called different names. And mm -hmm. so this area that Ron was going to, I think when he first went to, was called Saglik Suyu. And then eventually, many years later, it was called Kazan. And then now they call it Arzeb. So you may have a, a Turkish name, you may have a Kurdish name, you may have an Armenian name, you know, you mm -hmm. may have different names yep. for the same geographic area. Yeah, in Israel, we see that, that very same, same thing. Very same yep. thing happening. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the areas that we, uh, that of course he ended up was right here. Uh, there were a whole pile of these uh, large drogue stones. Uh, we found uh, about, I'd say 30 of them. Uh, I think when Ron initially went over, he found maybe uh, 12 to 14. But, of course, as time has gone by and erosion has occurred in different areas, you find some standing up uh, erect, and you find others that are just lying down. In okay, the explain what this drogue stone is and what, uh, you know, how, how, how this would have been used and, and uh, its significance here. Um, one of the things that we noticed with these large stones here is uh, the tether hole. And uh, some people, of course, have criticized, you know, that, well, how could, you know, this thing obviously is about 10 feet in height. They're about five to six feet in width and fairly slender, maybe a foot, 16 inches wide. And so they're fairly uniform then. Yeah, they're designed, of course, to, be, to create drag. Uh, you, you attach them to the ship, if you were to attach them to the stern. Um, it's designed to, to create drag in the rear of the ship so that the bow is lifted. And of course, this would be uh, vital, this would be of vital importance to make the ship seaworthy. Because when the bow is raised and you have wave action against the bow, it, it heads the, the ship directly into the wave instead of going broadside. Okay? Mm -hmm. so it had a, Which would cause a, a rollover. It was a potential rollover. Mm -hmm. So if you could imagine the, the flood was uh, being a global flood, had to be pretty horrific, uh, something that we've never experienced uh, since. But you would have to have a mechanism, uh, kind of a self-contained mechanism that would automatically head the ship into turbulence as opposed to, to changing it. These, these drogue stones were able to accomplish that. But one of the things that we noticed eventually was that as we found multi, uh, multiple uh, drogue stones, we found that some had the uh, tether hole <clears throat> with a, a center rib. So it was kind of honed out on this side and honed down on this side, and you had kind of a, a center rib still uh, protruding in the middle there. And so these stones, we believe, were, were used to control the pitching and the rolling. They were uh, along the entire length of the, uh, the hull, supported by two ropes coming down, one from each side like this, and the stone was fixed on that rope. So as the ship would pitch this way, you would have this swinging motion this, this swinging motion under the ship perpendicular to the hull, and that would control it from uh, severe pitching and rolling, you see. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. they had other drogue stones that we found where the hole, the tether hole, was just drilled straight through with no, no honing, and we believe they were just secured onto the extended keels, and that created the drag in the back, which raised the bow. So you had all these kind of things. Uh, um, of course, Noah and his family, I mean, God is so merciful uh, to, to actually go through an experience like that and, and survive on a ship. Uh, some of the testing that's been done in the wave tests uh, in, in, in some of the controlled environments uh, showed that the wave action would be too severe to even, even survive. If you, even if, the, even if the, uh, the ship survived, just the wave action, the rolling back and forth would, would just throw you around too much. God thought of everything. 
and these people were going to survive. He was going to ensure that. And so he used these drogue stones. Almost it's it, the same principle like the shock absorbers in your car. You know, they, they just slow down that motion. Mm -hmm. And the car, it's, of course, up and down, but this was side to side. Mm -hmm. So pretty fascinating to design yeah. and technology. Uh, and Jerry, used. is there uh, any uh, indication as far as on these drogue stones? We understand that uh, uh, that uh, after the fact, they may have uh, of, you know given some kind of indication of what these are all about. Uh, sure. One of the things that you'll notice, uh, your viewers will notice on some of these, they have these crosses that are etched on there. And on most of the stones, we find eight crosses. Now, why do you think there would be eight crosses? On well, there were eight people that were on the ark. Only eight survived the flood. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so the Bible, yes, the Bible uh, verifies mm -hmm. that uh, even, even despite the fact that you hear other stories to the contrary, the Bible recognizes that there were with Noah and his wife and then his three sons and their wives. Mm -hmm. So these were the eight that, passengers. Right. Now this is also, as you talk about uh, different names for places, this is also a place called the Valley of the Eight, is it not? That's correct. This particular area where a lot of these drug stones are found is called the Valley of the Eight. The, the local people there don't know why. They just know that that's what it used to be called. Mm -hmm. And of course, again, when people groups are displaced, you lose a lot of information sometimes from, from what had happened in the past. R right, so, right. And so. uh, they, they didn't uh, do a good job video recording it all to pass on to the next generation. <laughs> yeah. and, and so that brings us up to uh, the, the question. Obviously, crosses on here have got to be from a much later date. Uh, you know, uh, no one and his sons didn't get out there and chisel eight crosses on these anchor stones. Right. Uh, so so yes. uh, give us a little background of why archaeologically we would see that. Yeah, these uh, seem to come from the Byzantine era, which would have been a, the uh, Christian, the Christians would have been living in this area at that time. Mm -hmm. And they would have recognized, uh, passed down, I'm sure passed down from, you know, father to son and, and how things are passed down. They would have recognized the importance of these artifacts. And so eventually, not wanting that insight to be lost through history, uh, they would go ahead and mark them with mm -hmm. and uh, Byzantine different crosses. style crosses. No, right. no question about that. So, sure. yeah. And so some of them we find marked, some of them we don't. Ones that are typically in the ground that have been unearthed at a later time, they apparently were not visible. Uh, to mm -hmm. those folks at that time, but yeah, now I'm, I'm surprised to hear that you'd found that many in later times. All I knew about is the dozen or so that that Ron spoke of. Sure, uh, so. actually, the further back um, west that you go, uh, you'll find you'll find uh, kind of a, a line of stones. The, the further further back that you go, and it was this, it was as if they were uh, floating. Of course, by this time, uh, through this area. Uh, because you have a mountain ridge on each side, and so they're kind of floating down a valley. But when they hit some of these high plateau areas, uh, these stones would would uh, bottom out, and they would just cut them loose. Cut the cut, cut the loose. ropes. Cut them loose. Them uh -huh. so, so Excellent. Can, Excellent. So you see the you know you see the the line of stones that kind of lead you in the direction that the that the ark eventually ended up um, over about about 20 kilometers south eastwardly of the, air, the, the peak area. So itself. this really was an incredible mm -hmm. find for the vehicle to stop at these areas where, where you know, for one, the, the anchor stones were because sure. this isn't anything that anyone would even imagine would be um, a part of Noah's Ark. Of course, the local people uh, currently are Kurdish and <clears throat> so they're Muslim. Most, of, most all of them are Muslim in that area. And so this, this really wouldn't mean, they, they recognize the, the historical aspect of uh, you know, the Christians having been there. And that's another thing that we have to be careful of. If we call too much attention to some of these things, uh, there's a tendency for them to go missing or to be destroyed mm -hmm. in that area. So we have, to, we have to be careful. And it's nice that we've been able to go and document uh, a lot of this evidence. Mm -hmm. uh, this this particular rock here, if you look at it closely, you'll see how it has some grooves running through it, and um, it's about seven eight hundred pounds in terms of weight, and it, it actually has uh, broken off from a larger rock. And there was always some debate. This used to be up on the formation, on the side of the formation. Okay. Of the now ship. We, we haven't even talked about the formation yet. So okay, should so we'll, we, we should we talk about that, uh, uh, or, or or give people background 
formation of what? Well, actually, before we get to that, let me just say the reason I brought this up was because what we eventually realized is that this was a sounding stone. In other words, the scripture indicates that the floodwaters were 15 cubits above the highest mountain. And of course, the topography was different pre-flood, but how would they know that? You know, they, we don't think they had electronic sonar equipment or anything of the sort. But we do believe what they had here was a sounding stone. They would be able to drop a stone down to be able to check the depth of the water. And, of course, a sounding stone is something that would have no uh, relative importance after the fact. In other words, they would just leave it on the, uh, the ship itself. No sense of taking it off. You're not going to be able to use it for anything. Mm -hmm. But because of the way the grooves are structured through there, we, we think that this was, uh, they had it in like a net, a rope net, and they would just lower it down, and they could even leave it um, in the water for an extended period of time. And so we believe that's why you had the, the, the rope um, <clears throat> put those grooves uh, actually in this particular rock being down there. But it's a way that they could tell how deep the water was. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a way they could tell when to cut off, you know, because one area, they, they've cut off quite a few of the drogue stones in one particular area. It probably just stopped the ship in its tracks, and <clears throat> God probably said, you know, I don't, I don't want it here. I want you further on. And uh, he got the message to them somehow, and they were able to cut those things loose. But, you know, some people would say, well, you know, these, these, uh, the tether holes in these stones are, are too close to the top. Some of them are fairly close to the top. And, of course, some portions have been broken off, um, so you don't have the complete stone there. But, of course, you have to remember when you put a stone, even a, a heavy one like that, it's not designed. When you put it in water, it's buoyant to a certain extent. And its only, does, its only purpose is really to ski, what I call skiing in the water. You know, as the ship is moving forward, uh, that, that is just designed to create some drag. It's not, it's not designed to really hold the weight of it. Now, if you put a rope on it today and picked it up from the tether hole, it would probably break off because you're trying to pick the entire weight up. But in the water where you have the buoyancy, it would work just perfectly. You see? Mm -hmm. um, there have been other folks that uh, we don't find any drogue stones anywhere in the world with uh, the distinction that these have. The, the honed tether holes, uh, the, you know, the, the crosses etched on them, the eight crosses etched on them, etc. Right. Yeah, this is uh, unique <laughs> they're, they're to the They're very area. unique. It's only right there, yeah. and which is all in line yeah. with what was uh, uh, then later discovered as the petrified remains of, of the ark. Sure. So really, <clears throat> you know, you put it all together. If you want to look at one individual piece, uh, people can try to find an explanation for it, but you just put a couple of the pieces together, there, you can't describe it any other way. And, and as far as drogue style anchor stones, you know, anchor stones like this, uh, they exist all over, but not of That's this size, correct. not anything that, uh, that we have there. Yeah, I found one uh, uh, in a small town going further west. Uh, actually, if you keep going west from Dugobizet, you'll or from Arzeb, you'll run into uh, Lake Vaughan. And um, um, I, I ended up finding a, a stone uh, close to that area that was about 17 feet in height and it was about 8 to 10 feet wide. So uh, that, that could have been the anchor stone, hmm. you know, because hmm. it, was, it was twice as large as some of these larger stones that we find, you see. But, uh, and again, there, 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 there probably are other things out there. The, the, uh, the remains of the ship was over 500 feet in length and so if you had uh, stones all along the hull underneath that would hang down, it's a good possibility there are more than 30 out there. We just, you know, haven't uh -huh. had an opportunity to find them. Okay. But yes, well, much larger than your typical ones that you might have around the Sea of Galilee. Uh, right, yeah. right. They're, they're all small. As sure. a matter of fact, uh, uh, they're, they're very similar to the ones that are used on fishing nets. I have several that were just used on fishing nets. Sure. So... But again, same same style. The hole right at the top, where where you would uh, put the rope through and tie it to a fishing net, to a fishing boat, uh, to one of the ships that would haul the boats. Yeah, sea anchors yeah. are used even today, uh, yeah. obviously much smaller scale, mm -hmm. and for the same yeah. purpose. You see, mm -hmm. for the same yeah. purpose. So yeah, it's absolutely. just fascinating that that God would uh, insert this kind of technology 
onto this ship. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. A lot of people have the idea that uh, that back then they were uh, an ancient, uh, dumb culture. But uh, you know, we see in the Book of Genesis that Tubal Cain was an instructor of every artificer yes. yeah. of brass and iron. They, these are man-made alloys, and this is right back in the very beginning. They they were not uh, they were they were not as slow as we are. And the environment was uh, actually pristine for that kind of, of metallurgy as well. Uh, that, that's right. You, know, yeah, you had greater yeah. oxygen, greater pressure, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So yeah. uh, the yeah. environment was, was uh, better right. suited for that yeah. kind and of activity. Instead of uh, hitting uh, senility at 60 years of age, uh, you know, they, <laughs> were, uh, they were in their prime at 600, 800, 900 years of age. Uh, that's how long they were living. And, uh, you know, the, the, the mental capacity of these people far beyond, uh, you know, where we are today. We, we need the help of computers to get us close to what they were doing in some of these yeah. uh, things you're going to be showing us. Yeah, if you really analyze it, we're, we're just about 10%. Humanity today is about 10% of what um, existed pre-flood, before the flood. In, in age, you know, longevity, mm -hmm. uh, they, they were living over 900. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're fortunate if we make it to 90, 95 hundred years they were they were ten times that that they were ten times the mass you know where we might be 200 pounds they were easily 2,000 pounds in mass they were two and a half times larger um, which accounted uh, obviously for a lot of that yeah. mass and then and a lot of these uh, the pre-flood giants the remains have been found as a matter of fact uh, you've got some things to show us you actually have some uh, uh, some digits of uh, of these pre-flood yeah, you want to take a look at those now? Yeah, let, let, let's, let's do that. Okay. All right. Um, maybe before we even look at that, well, yeah, let me show you this here. Uh, this is a piece of petrified coral. Okay. And yes. mm -hmm. uh, where does coral grow? Uh, underwater, in yeah, the sea. Coral grows in the sea, and it takes about a year for it to really develop to any significant size. And when you go uh, into this particular area, all over this area, you're at about, uh, um, not in our zip, but over uh, in the area where the ark remains are, you're, you're at about 6,000 to 8,000 feet, 9,000 feet when you get up to... Yeah, close to two miles. Oh, uh, 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 yeah. Start and, with one. And over one up to 2,000, two, uh, up to two miles. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Truckloads. And I mean, literally, I'm just no exaggeration, truckloads of this stuff uh, all over the area. Mm -hmm. At eight, nine thousand foot elevation, that area. I mean, what what the evidence shows and reveals is that that area was covered for over a year with water. Okay, and uh, just again, it's just the physical evidence, mm. the keys that help us understand yeah. that. Lots of of coral over there. Um, this here is uh, uh, very fascinating. Um, one of the things that, of course, occurred uh, in the area of uh, our zip that Ron went to initially, uh, not only did he find the large drogue stones there that caught his attention immediately, but an one of the other piles of rock led him directly to what he believed was Noah's post-flood home. Uh, you know, he, he lived 350 years after the flood, mm -hmm. yeah. okay? Um, and so, obviously, he would be... Uh, um, building and, you know, living, surviving, uh, growing things, uh, and, and uh, doing husbandry, you know, mm -hmm. raising cattle and so forth. Well, in that same area where you find uh, an altar, and uh, again, we've got, I think, some pics of that. Yeah, here's one of the areas here. You can see the size of this person standing on it as compared to uh, somebody that would be two and a half times larger. It would be a perfect height for uh, somebody that was much larger to, to uh, do their sacrifice. And we believe that that's one of the things that Noah, of course, would do immediately after he exited the, the ark. He ended up uh, sacrificing to God. Mm -hmm. um, uh, which uh, brings up now there's some, some debate whether it was, we, we know that of unclean animals, it was two and two. But, uh, but of the clean animals, it was a, a larger number. Correct. Uh, some say seven pairs, uh, others say seven. And it, it's uh, really, this is something that rabbis argue about because I'm sure. just not sure. <laughs> but if it is uh, seven animals, then you would have an extra male that would be used for the sacrifice for each of the clean animals. Correct. And then you've got uh, mm -hmm. three pair 
of uh, of animals otherwise. Right. And so uh, that that's part of uh, what uh, uh, when my children were young, we were always looking for uh, illustrations of Noah's Ark in which it actually had mm -hmm. seven animals and not just two by two. And right. it was rare. Sometimes we had to make our own in order to do that. How about that? Yeah, I've heard some of those debates before. Uh, again, uh, uh, Ron never intended on looking for this, never even entered his mind or his thinking, but God piled some rocks up, stopped the cab, and this is the area that it led him to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, he, he of course, uh, found a, a home site. Now, we, we don't know 100% if that was a home site or if it was just a shrine that was erected after the fact. But... Yeah, because you got we we know Byzantine Christians were in right. the area. They right. recognized it, so sure. uh, we we see the Garden Tomb area where uh, Byzantine markings are are uh, there at the Garden Tomb in Israel. Sure. So we know that these places that were recognized in antiquity, they did something to mark them so that uh, you know I, not only was I there, but this is what this is all about. Sure. Sure. And there were some other things that Ron found in this particular area. There was, uh, in fact, what he was told um, after doing a, a survey of the area because he, he found some, some, uh, some walls that were about 14 feet in height that were covered with blue tiles. And on the tiles was a mural of the boat, the ship. Okay? And, of course, today, when you, when you go to that area, most all of that wall has been torn down and the, and the tiles and the mural, it's all gone. Uh, but fortunately, Ron was there to see it uh, firsthand in 77. The other thing was uh, that was of astounding uh, report is he found the grave markers where apparently uh, Noah and Mrs. Noah were buried in that area. And unfortunately, um, I guess it's unfortunate that when he did some, some ground penetrating radar in that area, he detected some gold in, in certain locations. And when he turned that information over, I, I guess what his motive was, he was thinking, you know, perhaps we could go ahead and get these exhumed. And now we have physical evidence of the size of the people and so forth before the flood. But I guess because of the corruption that exists in some of those areas, um, um, when, after Ron leaves, at some point, some of the locals were hired to come in and actually dig up that area. And what they found, uh, Michael, was a, a sarcophagus, a stone sarcophagus that was 18 feet in length. And uh, uh, that, of course, is quite unusual uh, today. And, <clears throat> and inside uh, that was a, a skeletal remains that were about 15 feet in length, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So again, the people before mm -hmm. the flood, this was obviously um, either, uh, it was either Noah or his wife, and we've come to, to think because of the, the, the crown, the decorative crown on the head, and of course he had a, a bonnet, a jeweled crown, a bonnet, we believe that that was Mrs. Noah. And the people that, that of course exhumed that, they were only after the treasure, but the real treasure was the remains that uh, ended up scattering everywhere. They had, uh, uh, it's not surprising to go over into a hotel over there in Dougal Buys in a hotel lobby and see different things displayed. And in, in some, <clears throat> some of those hotels, we found uh, large jaw bones, you know, much larger than ours today, and skulls and things of that nature. And of course, uh, a lot of the smaller bones were left right there at the site. Uh, after they hauled off the uh, sarcophagus, and this is one of them here, and this is a uh, yeah, been identified. It's been identified uh, through a radiologist, and of course you can even see the marrow here. This is the marrow, and this has been identified as the middle phalange bone. Uh, so anybody uh, that has any medical training realizes that in your hand, your fingers have three phalange bones here, and this is the middle one here, and you can see the uh, the difference. About two and a yeah. half, three yeah. times yeah. Yeah. the size. That looks, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm under six. I'm uh, five foot nine, and that, yeah. is, uh, that is three times the size of mine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Scripture, of course, records uh, that, you know, that there were, were giants uh, in the land, of course, during that time. Um, I don't think a lot of people have, have understood that, that really what he was indicating there was that the whole... The whole planet, the whole planet was was uh, just 
part of that environment. The people were larger, the animals were large. In the archaeology mm -hmm. archeo record, we find uh, remains of large animals, you know, uh, beavers the size of black bears, you know, four or 500 pound beavers. And of course, if you have big beavers, you need bigger trees. And so, you, you know, the trees were, uh, mm -hmm. you know, probably some of them six, 700 feet in height. All of nature was much larger. The fruit, the trees, the vegetation, the animals, the people. It was, the world was uh, like a hyperbaric chamber. Uh, greater oxygen. We've, uh, we've uh, done some experiments with the, the bubbles in the amber. And the oxygen level was at least 35%, probably greater than that, maybe 40 which is twice of what it is today, you see. So greater pressure, greater yeah. oxygen. Mm -hmm. And uh, you end up with a bigger, bigger world, bigger nature. Well, we're just uh, beginning. Now, uh, uh, Shosh, we have some, something else here that, uh, that's indicative of, uh, of this uh, Noah and his family here. This is oh, it. Oh, that's right. Okay, now here, here, here we go. Now we're, we're starting to, uh, uh, to get into the, the edifice itself. What's uh, the, the remains up there? Sure. We can't even start on this because uh, the, you've got a lot of information on this, a lot of, uh, of the imagery, of course, uh, being over there. How many times have you been over there now? To this particular site here about 30 times. About 30 times. Yeah. So, so this, is, uh, this is decades of experience that is speaking uh, from this area. And, and you have many more artifacts to show you. Sure. Uh, what I want to do is have you back next week. Let's continue on this. Let's get more into, into this. And then um, let's, let's go to Gomorrah. I, I know that uh, that you've been there a lot. I've been there a lot. It's just two hours south of the house, so uh, you know I take every every tour of Israel that I do. I take them to that particular site, and nice. so we are going to uh, uh, have uh, have you back this next week, and we'll take it from there. I'd like to close with prayer. Yivarecha Yahovah vaYishmarecha Yair Yahovah panavelecha vichinaka Yisa Yahovah panavelecha vayisem lecha shalom. Yehovah bless you and keep you. Yehovah make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Yehovah lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace in the name of Yeshua, the Prince of Peace. Shabbat Shalom to our fans, Shavu Tov. We'll see you next week here on Shabbat Night Live for more biblical archaeology extraordinaire. See you then. Mm -hmm.